Hi, I'm Bob Ellsworth. What have I got in store for you? Oh, all the adventures I've shared, whether they're on islands or offshore or wherever they might be. Had a lot of good times with a lot of wonderful people. Met some very notable people and very, very capable people. And that's what I want to tell you about because there's stories that go with everybody in this world. And that was part of our adventure. And we enjoyed it whenever we went on these adventures. And they were on island. Sable Island was one of them off the coast of Canada down in Florida for another adventure, and then with Maureen O'Hara, one of my favorite Hollywood actresses, in the adventures of putting together the documentary of the big plane which can be seen up at the New England Air Museum. Join us, won't you? Thank you. Hi again, Bob Ellsworth here with a Nutmeg TV, Channel 5, and we'll tell you all about a place called Sable Island, which many of you may have flown over back and forth across the Atlantic to Europe many times. And sometimes on the loudspeaker system from the pilot's cockpit, they tell you that you're right over Sable Island. I wanted to make a documentary because there was a great market for the documentary. And I thought, something unusual. And I had heard about Sable Island through a friend that's how you get into trouble when you hear about things through a friend in this world. But it sounded fascinating because of the tremendous number of wrecks. And the irony of it is there was a ship that was wrecked off Sable Island, a merchant ship, called the Man SS Manhasset. And that's kind of the sort of the area I come from on Long Island, Manhasset. Uh, we lived in Plandome adjacent to Manhasset. So a lot of things fascinated me about the island. Sable Island is about, oh, I'd say a mile and a half, two miles wide, about 21 miles long, and it's moving at the rate of an eighth of a mile a year. Some say that's the general direction of the continental shelf. I'm not sure of that. I don't want to be there when they find out about it. But it houses wild horses. These are the residual beings from other shipwrecks, of which there have been many through the centuries. And I have to tell you also the fact that the particular type of seal that inhabits Sable Island is called the harbor seal. They have some gray seals. There's a little difference in their, in their characteristics and backgrounds. But they all do the same thing. They dive and they play and they are just great animals to watch. And the little flowers that grow on Sable Island, tiny roses. And then there was the beautiful cake that was made by the skipper of the island, uh, Mr. Bell and his wife. And she, uh, she made a, a cake and invited me over one night for dinner from these little berries that grew around this lake, inland lake. In the middle of this little island is an inland lake. And guess what? Not salt water, but fresh water. And I saw a baby seal with the most beautiful eyes take one look at me, and it ran, I don't blame it, and it ducked into the fresh water. And I can't tell you how deep, but that water was the source of refreshment for the horses that lived on the island. They knew where the fresh water was, but it was surrounded in the most beautiful way on the tips. You could see the, the ocean coming in from three different directions. So there was nothing but photography on that island, as you can well imagine. And we got a lot of phot photography of the wildlife on Sable Island, but we never had been successful in getting it released. So then, one day, a gentleman came to see me, and he had something on his mind that was called, I want to make a production and a film of Sable Island, but I was only able to go there for a day. You spent a month up there, which I did with a crew, he said, and in the way that it was originally in those days, and that was just a little over 20 years ago, he said, and I need to look at your film. Well, what a thing, an awakening voice from the past. I said, be glad to share it with you. I had outtakes as well as my own documentary to share with him. And he came down from Montreal. His name is Philippe Bailoc. And in conjunction with the Board of uh, Film Review in Canada, he was about to make a beautiful film called The Moving Sands, which you're going to see tonight. Why am I enthusiastic about this? Because he was so nice to me, 
as to keep me and my crew in some of the scenes toward the end, and you'll see me flying around in a burnous. Wait till I show you the burnous I was flying around in, in the sands of Sable. Let me see if I can show this to you. That's called a burnous, the fellow with a mustache on the left. Lee Prettyman was a, a former diver and personality in Hartford. He was with us on the dive as well. And we both discovered a lot of things about Sable Island, the wrecks, the people that inhabited it from the government, whether a long term or a short term, things that we were able to share with them. But an unusual story is being told on this production, The Moving Sands, by Philippe. And it's a wonderful story, and I won't give away any more of the figures or facts because you'll be thrilled to see it. And some of my underwater footage is included. And it was so nice of Philippe because he enjoyed utilizing some of that film, and he did. And they were called in, the Board of Review called them in for a complimentary session at its conclusion, and I was invited to share the stage with him because he wanted to credit me for our portion of the film and everything that uh, comprised Sable Island when we were there. When we were able to share extensively because he couldn't be there the same length of time I was. So, Bob Ellsworth again, welcoming you, glad to see you back, and please enjoy The Moving Sands. When I set out for Sable Island, I pictured a place littered with wrecks, laden with traces of its fascinating history. Naively, perhaps, I hoped to find a long-lost treasure, but where could it be hidden? In the end, I found it on the other side of the continent, on Vancouver Island, a treasure far more precious than anything I could have imagined. The treasure belonged to a woman named Beatrice Boutelier. More than a century ago, she took hundreds of photographs of her island. Inspired by her vision, I have pieced together the history of this beautiful and terrible place. In 1967, at the age of 88, she returned to her island. I have imagined myself traveling with her for that last visit to Sable. Her story is the story of the island. Some 60 years ago it was that I left Sable Island, and oh, how I've missed it. What I wouldn't give to spend the summer on a Sable horse with my camera.
I wouldn't mind if I died here, and they could bury me here too. After years of searching, I know now what lies hidden beneath this long, barren sandbar. I was a slip of a girl, just 15, when I began collecting all I could find on the ghosts and the heroes of Sable. And like the wild horses of my island, in a way, I never really left. My father, Robert Boudelier, came to Sable in 1879 to work as a carpenter. Five years later, he returned with us to settle. I was so proud of him. He was superintendent of the life-saving crews. Their job was to bring shipwrecked mariners and passengers safe and sound to the island. I moved here at the age of five and a half and was known by one and all as Trixie. We lived at what we called the main station, now entirely buried by sand. Oh, much of the island's history lies hidden under the sands. There are no trees or rocks here to mark the passage of time. In fact, the oldest trees my brothers and I ever found were of petrified wood. The last traces of primordial forests that grew here millions of years ago. Sable was at one time the high point of an ancient archipelago of large islands. But the sea level, rising since the last ice age, some 13,000 years ago, submerged the rest of the formation. Carved by the waves and the wind, my island was reborn from the waters. Windborne seeds took root. Migrating birds returned to their old stopover, and herds of sea mammals rediscovered her shores. And now I've come back too. Some days I'd have sworn the wind could have blown our house away. Even the ghost took cover. The morning after a storm, we were always just a little surprised to find that the island was still there. I know now what causes this apparent miracle. It's marum grass, which we call sword grass. It keeps the island from disappearing altogether. Roots plunge deep into the sands, holding fast in the face of relentless winds. And that's what allows large dunes to form. Of course, since I was last here, the landscape's utterly changed. Waves, wind and rain shape and shift the dunes in an endless cycle of growth and destruction. The 
island wasn't dangerous for us, but it surely was for all those who approached it unawares. It's surrounded by underwater sandbars, you see, not to mention the currents. Out at sea, off Sable, the warm Gulf Stream meets the cold waters from Labrador, which makes for many a dense fog and treacherous waves. I often wonder what it was like for the first sailors who ventured into these unknown waters. To navigate, they had to rely on the stars. Some might have known of Sable Island, but placing her on the chart was a matter of guesswork. Though I put this question to all and sundry, I never do get a firm answer. Who first set foot on Sable Island? A Micmac? A Breton? A Basque? A Viking, perhaps? No one knows. It was Portuguese sailors in the 1500s who first left traces of their presence. With its many freshwater ponds, abundant vegetation, and mild climate, the island would be a paradise for cattle. A well stocked larder for famished sailors right there on the open sea. In my day, too, we were almost completely self sufficient and proud of it. We grew our own vegetables, we cut hay, we gathered wild eggs, and we raised animals for meat, milk, butter, and cheese. For us, the island was generous as it was for the first explorers with its bonanza of Portuguese cattle. So when did this curse descend on Sable Island? Was it with a certain Hungarian poet, Parmenius, who perished in one of the first shipwrecks off the island? Or was it with the leader of that ill-fated expedition, Sir Humphrey Gilbert, as early as Elizabethan times, the island was considered unlucky. In my day, there was a big lake here, just a run and a jump from the house. Over time, winter storms filled it with sand. All that's left now is a refuge for a handful of harbor seals, happy to escape from the ravenous sharks that lurk offshore. Oh, in the 1700s, there'd be all kinds of ships anchored off Sable, and some did venture into what was called the Large Pond. Fed by the tides, this landlocked harbor was teeming with flatfish, eels, crabs, and clams. In our time, it was known as Wallace Lake, a great place to fish and have fun. It was by the small inlet to this old lake that the first tragic attempt was made to settle Sable Island in 1598. A French adventurer, the Marquis de La Roche, set forth from France for our island, which lies 150 kilometers from the nearest point on the coast of North America.
he set down 50 men and the makings of an outpost and sailed back to France. For a few years, he sent supplies, but when that stopped, the men mutinied, many were killed. Eventually, de la Roche got wind of their plight and sent help. Back in France, 11 bedraggled survivors, clad in sealskin, were paraded before King Henry IV, and the king, aghast at the pitiful sight, pardoned the lot and allowed them to keep the valuable fox pelts they brought back with them. Now, how Black Fox ever got on Sable Island remains a mystery. Legend has it that one of the survivors of the massacre chose not to return and is said to have lived here for many years. He was a Franciscan monk. Sable Island was his sanctuary. I often dreamt of that man. I'd have liked that, to have the whole island all to myself. When I was young, I used to daydream about what I'd have found to eat if that had been me. Between the two high crests of sand that form the island, there are several freshwater ponds bursting with life. Plants of all kinds, flowers, roots, and most of all berries, and especially the famous Sable Island cranberry. In October, my father would get his men to harvest the cranberries. Every year, we'd send some 400 barrels to Nova Scotia, where they were highly prized. Personally, I preferred the island's strawberries. We always took a lovely picnic when we went berry picking. was home to thousands of seals. With my camera, I'd go seek them out. And once or twice, got close enough to catch a smile.
on occasion, objects from the distant past had to wash up on the beach. There was one that fascinated me. An old skull that my father found and proudly displayed on his desk. He told me that many centuries ago, Sable Island had been the kingdom of hundreds and hundreds of walruses. In the 1600s, the Mary and Jane sailing from Boston was wrecked on Sable. Her captain, John Rose, came upon an island chock full of animals. News of the bountiful prey spread quickly and soon bands of hunters, both French and English, converged on the island, setting aside their differences in favor of the hunt. And in a few short decades, most of the cattle and walrus were gone. Far from Sable, the conflicts continued until a truce in 1713 officially made the island territory of the British crown. This is where I spent 25 years of my life. I was going on 16 when my mother died here. <laughs> and now I've lived my whole family. And it's only a matter of time before I join them and the dunes swallow up our home. And then the photographs I took of those times will be all that's left. My brothers, my sister and I were not the first children to live on the island. Previous superintendents and lighthouse keepers got their children down to Sable and plenty were born here. I think perhaps the first child ever to set foot on the island was shipwrecked with Robert Elliot in 1760. I can picture them there on the strand. Alive, yes, poor things, but perished with cold and fear. When the storms would blow, we'd be snug in our house. But I can well imagine what those castaways must have had to endure.
At the time the Elliot party made it to shore, there was precious little to feed 70 hungry souls. Or so it seemed. Lucky for them, the island was home to some new inhabitants. Horses. I was so used to living with horses that it never occurred to me to ask the obvious question. How did they get here? A few years before the Elliot shipwreck, a Protestant pastor from Boston named Le Mercier had a plan to settle the island with rescue parties. He partially realized his dream. In the end, though, the project proved too costly, and he pulled his people out. But he did leave his horses behind. And their descendants, all 300 of them, may now be the last isolated wild herd on the planet. The price of freedom, of course, is their constant battle with the elements. I remember a little foal whose mother had died and who had by some miracle survived the winter. It took some doing, but I convinced my father to let me raise her. I called her Bonnie Bell. Living on a farm, we never kept the mares for long. And one day, Bonnie Bell was sent to Halifax to be sold along with the other horses. With a heavy heart, I tied a card around her neck. Trixie's pet, it read. Be good to her. That was the last I saw of her. Each new shipwreck was an event. We would salvage goods and equipment from the ship and use the wood for winter fuel. As a girl, I remember storms blowing away entire dunes, exposing skeletons of ancient ships in the sand. The most famous wreck spotter was a fellow by the name of Benjamin Chadwell, marooned on the island in the late 1700s. He claimed to have walked the length of the island and back, a full 90 kilometers, spotting the remnants of wrecks all along the way. He never lacked for firewood. One stormy night, the house of 40 vaults near his camp were covered over with sand. In no time, another 40 had been uncovered.
Even back then, a great many ships had met their fate off Sable. Living in a ship's graveyard, we learn to expect the unexpected. Among the traces of the past that had rise up to the surface were bricks, ballast stones, even human bones. And these discoveries fed our imaginations to overflowing with ghost stories. My favorite was inspired by an actual incident that was to change our island for good. As the story goes, Mrs. Copeland, a society matron from Halifax, was returning from England on board the Francis, which happened to be carrying the belongings of the Duke of Kent. En route for Nova Scotia, the ship was lost in a storm. The next day, two seal hunters made a grisly discovery. They admitted they'd found a body, but then one of them let slip a story of a ring. When the ship's goods, including the ring, appeared in Halifax, the sable squatters were suspected of having lured the Frances off course in order to steal her princely cargo. The public outcry at the story of the ring was what led John Wentworth, governor of Nova Scotia, to set up a permanent rescue service on the island. The golden age of sable marauders was over. Since that day in 1801, unless here by misadventure, no one is allowed on Sable Island without permission. As for Mrs. Copeland, some days her ghost had come right into my bedroom. I feel this icy draft and my chair begin to rock by itself. I got used to saying, come in, Mrs. Copeland, sit down, make yourself comfortable. father was my hero, all right, especially after the sudden death of my mother. He was seventh in a long and honorable line of superintendents. And now increasing maritime traffic between Europe and North America had led to many more wrecks at sea. Every time I'd hear that distant distress signal, my heart had skip a beat at the thought of my father not returning from his latest rescue mission.
According to legend, fishermen had sometimes spied the French monk blessing their ships from the top of his dune, and they were glad of it too, for their fate lay in the hands of a very capricious god. The day the boat called, the guide was wrecked in a dense fog. A remarkable woman happened to witness the tragedy. Her name was Dorothea Lynn Dix. And that ordeal gave her the idea to send modern lifeboats, which would greatly improve our life-saving operations. I felt the presence of her pioneer spirit every time my father rescued a shipwrecked mariner in one of his boats. Of course, for the girls of the island, forlorn sailors were not the first choice as potential suitors. <laughs> Some passengers arrived on Sable even more haphazardly. Rats arrived here courtesy of the Skidby wreck. When the cats, sent to deal with them, began to overrun the island, then fox were brought in to keep things in check. And when they became a threat to the birds, then it was open season on foxes. My brothers and I were soon expert hunters even at digging the fox out of their holes. It was around this time that a distinguished American ornithologist, Jonathan Dwight Jr., paid a visit. He taught us to observe the birds and even to prepare specimens for a museum in New York. So we learned all about a great many birds especially the Ipswich Sparrow that's never been found to nest anywhere else but Sable Island. But bird watching on my island actually began with another gentleman. Dr. John Gilpin came in the mid-1800s to attend a childbirth. While awaiting the event, he explored the island and was dazzled by its beauty. Miracle of miracles. The roses we planted some 60 years ago are still here.
One day, while working in the garden, I heard the strangest sound. To my horror, I watched a cloud of locusts descend on the island. For three years, they devoured everything. The horses and birds would all have starved had those grasshoppers not vanished as suddenly as they'd come. A beautiful big north wind blew them all out to sea. At the high tide, there were windrows of them three and four inches high where it had blown them up. And they were red, like dead soldiers. Though the grasshoppers had gone, the island's old curse still had a hold on the place. In 1898, the loss of the Burgoyne was front page news on both sides of the Atlantic. Among the drowned was a dear friend of one of the most famous men of the times. Alexander Graham Bell came to the island searching for survivors. There were none. but he and my father got on famously. And together they sought a solution to end the notorious isolation of Sable. They dreamt of a link between the island and the mainland by wind and water. And so was born the Sable Island Kite that towed behind it a float full of urgent messages. From earliest times, Sable Islanders had been cut off from the world. It is an island of solitude. Though for some, I think, the isolation is a blessing. By the end of the 19th century, thanks to visionaries like Bell, the island was connecting with the rest of the world. For me, it was his gift to me, this camera, that opened my eyes to Sable and beyond. At first, Mr. Bell's telephone only linked the two tips of our island. We got up the first telegraph antenna in 1905, and our very first wireless message to the mainland ended centuries of isolation. Sable was soon to be a key link in the transatlantic communication network that would change the world. I was 25 and keen to learn to operate the telegraph. I knew somehow that Mr. Marconi's invention would be my springboard to a new life.
soon all, new technologies could do little against the notorious sable storms. At the beginning of the 20th century, schooners ruled the seas around Sable. They generally stayed well away, but the rich fishing grounds around the island were an awful temptation. In August of 1926 and 27, terrific storms carried off a good number of the finest schooners. Many families on the mainland coast lost their menfolk. There's a legend that a phantom ship, the Sylvia Mosher, haunts the seas off Sable, a ghostly reminder of this terrible loss. Up until very recently, my island drew treasure hunters of all sorts. Of course, the riches of Sable Island come in many different shapes and forms. In the early 1960s, one of its greatest treasures almost disappeared. Federal authorities declared that the Sable Island horses were government surplus. They were about to be rounded up and shipped off the island when a storm of public protest stopped the government in its tracks. And ever since, the island has been preserved as a sanctuary for the horses and all its creatures. Now, it may just be coincidence, but soon after this attempt to get rid of the horses, major reserves of natural gas were discovered beneath the sand, so... both animals and ghosts learn to live with the constant drone of aircraft, landing and taking off from what used to be our Wallace Lake. Sable the Widowmaker had begun to claim its first victims from the sky. But our island was the greatest victim of all. In 1946, a year after the end of the war, Canadian authorities dumped thousands of barrels of mustard gas into our waters, a shoal of toxic time bombs. turn back the tide on this senseless dumping of poison. I might shelter the denizens of the waves and dunes from this final curse. When I lived here, Sable Island was isolated and feared.
today she lies in the flight path of the Concorde and in the sights of oil giants. She has become a fragile crescent in a sea of change. As an early warning sign for weather systems, pollution and climate change, she tells us what we are doing to our planet. I believe we should listen. <laughs> 